Hi, I'm Molly DeBlanc, um, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about community guidelines um, and the way that they look. Uh, uh, a quick disclaimer, um, I am going to be reading the slides uh, that I have up in case anybody has any vision problems or if somebody happens to be watching a video or just listening to the video, um, which is certainly what I do uh, when I, I that's the thing that I like to do is to just listen to them while I'm doing other things. Um, uh, so here's a little bit about me in context uh, of this talk um, and of being here. Um, until recently, I was at the Free Software Foundation, and now I'm at the GNOME Foundation. Um, I am on the board of the Open Source Initiative. I'm one of the directors there. And I'm a Debian developer. Um, so what I'm really going to be doing today is talking about my experience as a Debian developer. Um, I have had, uh, thanks to the Free Software Foundation, I've gone through training, a little bit of training for incident response. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about codes of conduct, looking at different types of community guidelines. I've, um, I'm currently on the Debian anti-harassment team, which I'm going to be talking about. I've been on incident response teams at multiple events, uh, including Libre Planet and DebConf. Um, and I've done a little bit of research about the ways that codes of conduct especially impact the ways that people communicate with one another on mailing lists. Uh, so that's, that's where I'm coming from for here today. Uh, so what is a community policy? That's a good question to be asking ourselves uh, when we want to talk about what it looks like when we enforce them. So free software communities are free as in kittens. It's basically a pile of kittens. It's something that you can just take home and then suddenly you realize you have this big responsibility that you have to manage and navigate and feed and take care of and water and, and watch it grow and watch it also at times be much less cute and much more annoying uh, than it is, especially when it first starts and you first uh, get it. Um, it's especially like a pile of kittens because if you've ever, one of my favorite gifts, I should add this gift to this talk, is somebody trying to line up a pile of kittens and then, so they're all, they'll all be there facing you and then one will turn around and run away and they'll be like, nope, 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 kitten. And then another one will turn around and run away, like, nope, kitten. Um, and I thought that was a really, it, it, it's not just uh, an analogy, uh, a metaphor for, for cat herding. Um, which is what a lot of people use when they describe interacting with communities. But it, it's actually kind of what communities look like, is people running around, uh, really participating when they want to, where they want to, how they want to. So because of that, we create different kinds of policies to describe behavior that we want to see or describe behavior that we don't want to see. Um, what makes a good community policy? Uh, that's a very good question. So there are all sorts of different things that people use to define what they think a community policy should look like. Um, some, th some of this is common knowledge. So recently, I've this is this is like a very new idea for me that I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, so recently, I've been thinking a little bit about how uh, like how we phrase community policies and what kinds of things we say are good in them. So. Uh, one of the things we say is we say it's important to point out, give specific examples of inappropriate behavior. Because when you give a specific example of something inappropriate, you then have something someone can point to and say, well, you know, it says in the code of conduct that somebody is not allowed to call somebody else a jerk face, and somebody called me a jerk face. So now I have this thing that I can point at and feel a little bit more comfortable rather than just saying, well, this person called me a jerk face and I don't know if that's appropriate or not appropriate because the code of conduct doesn't specify. Um, codes of conduct should have uh, clear communication points. So you should know who you're supposed to contact if somebody violates a code of conduct. Um, uh, those are two of, of the really big things. It should um, include comments about repercussions, things that could happen should you violate the code of conduct. Um, so I was talking with a friend of mine who uh, is a professor and teaches about um, collaborative communities. Um, he ran a session in one of his classes about codes of conduct and community policies. And he noticed that his students responded very negatively, consistently, to reading what we considered to be really good community policies. 
Um, so I've been thinking about this a lot because we, you know, we're already part of a club, right? We're part of this free and open source software club. Um, and we're part of a group of people within that who think about how do we create welcoming communities? How do we create diverse, inclusive spaces where people are represented, where people are welcome, where people can come to us from where they are and be uplifted and empowered to be their best selves within the community? Um, so we have these, these, these ways that we've begun to construct uh, how we talk about um, community policies. Uh, and, and they're based on these ideas we have coming from already being on the inside. Um, but this person's students who had nothing to do with, with any of the community, like, were, who I assume had nothing to do with these communities, uh, responded really negatively to, to this kind of language. They found that they didn't want to participate in something where people needed to be told not to do horrible things. Right, they, they responded uh, negatively to the way that rather than being rather than good behavior being described, negative behavior was being described. Um, so I've been spending a little bit more time thinking about how we have these practices uh, around how we talk about community policies, which are based on our own experiences within the communities that we participate in. Um, so. Uh, I don't really have any conclusions, but this is a thing I've been thinking about recently, um, and it's a thing that I would certainly be happy to have other people think about uh, or talk with me about in the future. Um, who uses community policies? Free and open source software communities use policies. Uh, all sorts of different ones do. Um, this is something that you see at more and more conferences. Linux Fest Northwest has one. Um, we see anti-harassment policies, codes of conduct, community guidelines, um, and these all kind of translate to the same thing where they're asking the people, part, the people around to behave in certain ways, regardless of what we're calling them. So now I want to talk a little bit about Debian specifically. Um, Debian uh, tries to manage the community through, so this is me wearing well, wearing my Debian developer hat, speaking as a Debian person, speaking as somebody involved with the Debian community. I'm not here representing the project in any official capacity. This is really just about my experiences. Um, so Debian has a couple different things. There's the DebConf Code of Conduct, uh, which is specifically for events. There's the Debian Code of Conduct, which is for mailing lists and IRC channels and other means of communication. There are community guidelines, uh, which aren't an official code of conduct, but help describe positive behaviors that you should be modeling as a contributor to the project. There's the diversity statement and the social contract, and neither of those are explicit uh, behavioral policies, but they are things that describe ideals and ideology that the community has and that they're trying to embody uh, and practice um, within these codes of conduct uh, and community guidelines. The social contract also helps inform or has helped inform what the rest of these things look like. Um, negative behaviors uh, take on many forms. There are lots of ways we behave that aren't great. Um, and in my experience, most of them are actually, uh, most of the ways that they actually play out are pretty innocuous um, or look pretty small. Um, so here are some examples of specific uh, behaviors, these are from the DebConf Code of Conduct. Um, uh, negative behaviors include uh, offensive, offensive verbal or written remarks related to gender, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion, deliberate intimidation, stalking or following, unwelcome sexual attention, sexist, racist, or other exclusionary jokes. Um, so these are just a few of the examples. Uh, something that uh, came up recently um, in a conversation I was having was that a lot of these codes of conduct and anti-harassment policies don't talk about violence um, and or, or graphic imagery from that perspective. They focus very much on sexual imagery um, uh, and, and uh, harassment. So that's maybe another thing that we should be thinking about moving forward is incorporating some of those ideas into how we talk about what is and is not appropriate behavior. Um, so negative behaviors are one thing that inform what kinds of things uh, we're 
we're viewing as acceptable. Um, one of the other things is just like, what kinds of behaviors do we want to model? What, what is the ideal of what our community looks like? Um, and somebody said that a good goal for a free software contributor is to be friendly and professional. Um, so it, it's these people, my best friend, many of my closest friends are people I know through free software. Um, I view free software as a wonderful place where I have found a community that I belong in. Um, that gives me purpose. I, you know, I can I can extol the virtues of that um, and my relationships. Um, but really, we're building something together. Um, we're building something that uh, with people who we're working with. They are, in a way, our colleagues um, and our collaborators, as well as our peers and our friends. So when we're working in these spaces, it's really useful to be thinking about well, how how do we keep this in a professional context, what kind of language we're using, is that a professional thing to do? Is that something I would do with one of my coworkers? Is that a way I would talk with a colleague? Um, so that's one of the goals. Uh, another thing to remember is that nobody's perfect. I'm gonna be talking a lot more about how, well, a little bit more about how nobody's perfect soon. Um, we all end up doing something wrong. Uh, and one of the most important things that we have to remember is that just because you do one thing wrong doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means that you're a person, um, and we're all fallible. Uh, someone was telling me right before this about a conversation he had with someone in his community where the person um, didn't even say something that was inappropriate. They said something that was off topic. Um, and when they were told, hey, can you shift the conversation back to being on topic, they misinterpreted it as them being told that their behavior was inappropriate. Um, so that's the kind of thing that happens. And I think in that context, it's really important to remember that like, on both sides, we, we kind of all are making mistakes um, all the time. And what your goal is as a participant and what the goal is of enforcing things is to always be doing better, right? to acknowledge that we've made mistakes, um, to acknowledge that things aren't the best that they could be, uh, and to learn from them and do do more moving forward to create these spaces we want to be in. So here are some specific examples from the Debian project. Um, first, I want to talk about what the anti-harassment team does, AH, or the anti-harassment team. Um, our goal is to make the community a more welcoming, more inclusive space where people are happy to participate, where people feel welcome. Um, and where people feel like they can be Debian, like Debianites or Debianers or whatever term you really want to use for that community. Um, from a practical perspective, we make recommendations to other teams. We don't generally, always, usually do things ourselves. Occasionally we do take action ourselves. Um, that's a very divisive thing to have happen because it's efficient, um, but it also centralizes power. Uh, which isn't a goal of ours, to be the same people making decisions and then uh, carrying them out. Um, so mostly what we do is we look at things people have reported to us and we then talk to others and say, hey, here's what we think should come out of this. Um, a little bit about our operating procedures. How it generally works is somebody sends us a report. Um, this is because there are many mailing lists. Uh, there is a lot of volume. So we don't police the mailing lists ourselves. Um, and we don't like to use the term policing either. Uh, so we don't read it through every post everyone makes uh, and determine whether or not what they said was OK or whether anyone is violating the code of conduct or the anti-harassment policy or the community guidelines or anything like that. Instead, what we do is we wait for people to come to us and to say, hey, somebody said this on an email list and I thought it was inappropriate. Um, or uh, somebody modeled this behavior at an event and that was a problem. Um, so every week, every other week we meet for about 90 minutes to two hours um, and we discuss reports. Um, so the things that came in, we make a big list of them and we just kind of go through them one at a time. Um, we write emails together. We see if there are any proactive things we need to be handling. Um, uh, we plan the requests that we'll be making to other teams. Uh, I forgot to, oh, yeah, this is the right slide, sorry. My screen got me confused for a second. Um, uh, the things that we want to ask other teams, we have a lot of internal debate 
um, about what we think is the right thing, how we want to interpret stuff, how we want to interpret what people said, and what kind of actions we think are the right ones to uh, carry out. Um, so here are some very specific examples. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe something that happened, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, or something that could happen, um, and then talk a little bit about what I personally would do, and then what we as a team did, um, because these aren't always the same thing. Uh, um, so one of the things to remember is that people are mean sometimes, even accidentally, and usually it's accidentally someone being mean. Um, this can come from different cultural communication styles. Um, I won't make any sweeping stereotypes, but I'm sure everybody can think of one uh, if they try really hard um, of, of some cultural stereotype about how people behave that is one that you would find uncomfortable. Um, but that's actually just okay. There are linguistic uh, differences. Since a lot of free and open source software communities are communicating in English, uh, and that's not many, many people's first language. Um, you see all sorts of different things that come up. Uh, gendered pronouns is a really good example um, where some languages deal with gender differently than other languages do. Um, and it doesn't occur to people to be communicating in certain ways um, that we consider within English and especially within like this progressive culture that uh, more projects are trying to model. Um, as appropriate behaviors. So people are mean and people are accidentally mean all the time. Uh, and some of this is stuff like accidentally misgendering someone. Some of this stuff is intentionally misgendering someone, calling people jerk faces, uh, taking inappropriate tones overall, becoming combative. Um, so what do I do in this situation? Um, so one thing that's really great about Debian, uh, especially in this context, is it does a lot of self-policing, uh, like self-monitoring. Um, so frequently when someone says something inappropriate, someone else points it out, uh, either in private or on list. A lot of people then respond by apologizing. Um, it's really great to see that happen. Um, it's simple, it's easy, and it involves us to do nothing. Um, but if somebody sends a report in saying that someone said something inappropriate or used inappropriate language, uh, generally, like my instinct is to look over it and determine whether I think that's inappropriate. So that's that's the community putting a lot of faith in me and my ability and the the ability of my colleagues on the team to make decisions about what is and isn't acceptable. So what we do. Uh, so, so then what I would do is I would send an email to the person and I would just explain, hey, this is this thing you said, this is how it made someone feel, um, and this is why we think that's not really the way you should be talking because it's not friendly and professional, uh, whether you realize it or not. Um, so what actually happens is the AHT meets, um, we're uh, less geographically diverse than we used to be. Um, so we're looking for new members, if anyone here is a Debian developer and wants to join the anti-harassment team. It's super fun. Um, it's great. We have meetings. They're 90 minutes to two hours every other week. It's very constrained responsibility, which is great. Um, uh, uh, but so we, we have a range of different cultural backgrounds, or we have had them over time. Um, uh, and we look at what something someone said and we determine whether or not we think it was actually inappropriate uh, or whether it was, and, and like, is it a misunderstanding? Who's misunderstanding whom here? Uh, is it the person who, like, is the person who reported something to us misinterpreting or is it the person who said something the, that they said was inappropriate? Um, and then we email them um, and we say, hey, this is, what you said is not great. Um, we always, always assume best intentions, um, and that's one of the most important things to do when you're looking at enforcing a community guideline or a community policy, is to make the assumption and to look at it from the perspective that the people here aren't trying to be bad. Um, that they might be, so if they, if they do call someone a name or they, they are using aggressive language, they're doing it because they're feeling emotional. Um, they're doing it as a reaction rather than a long thought out uh, intention of being mean, um, or, or that somebody is practicing cultural miscommunication. Um, we'll talk in a little bit about what happens when uh, someone is chronically 
uh, in such a, like, chronically uh, behaves and communicates inappropriately. Um, so there's that. Okay. So photo privacy incident. Um, so much of what Debian does and what happens within the community is in public. Um, it's on public mailing lists. Uh, the people write blog posts about things that happened. Um, so it's kind of nice that you know you can draw specific examples. This one is kind of interesting because uh, something happened at an event that somebody talked about um, in public, but parts of the conversation were also in private. Um, and I think this is really a great thing to talk about uh, because of that. So first, I'm going to tell a personal story. And this fits into the nobody's perfect, and we always try to do better. Um, so when I was a much younger version of myself, I was at a conference, and I took a photo of a room. Uh, and someone said, oh, can you delete the photo? I don't like to have my picture taken. And I, so I, I deleted the photo because they asked me, but then I got in my head that like, I really want, like I really, really wanted to get a picture of this person because they told me not to take a photo of them. So it actually turns out that unwanted photography or recording is against the DebConf code of conduct. This was at a DebConf. Um, so uh, eventually I, uh, I took a photo of this person and they were understandably very upset with me um, because I grossly violated their personal space and boundaries. Um, I didn't think of it that way at the time. I thought of myself as being clever and sneaky. Uh, and I regret that. Um, so I deleted the photo uh, again, and I apologized. Um, and I think they don't hate me. Uh, I haven't seen them since, but I hope they don't hate me. Um, so everyone's fallible, right? And the point of that story is actually that we should be trying to do better. Um, so uh, at another Debian event, uh, something similar happened where just one person took a photo of someone else that they didn't want to have taken. Um, so what would I do in this situation? Um, I would encourage the person involved who took the photo to do what I did, um, to, to remove it, to apologize for it, to uh, like think about what this means, to interpret, to, to try to do a better job accepting people's preferences in the future, um, to learn from the experience. As to what actually happened when this happened at a Debian event is I can't tell you um, because it was something that was handled in private and the people involved wish, wished the uh, conversation to remain in private. Um, so, I, so one of the reasons I think this is a great example is it's highlighting that when you're dealing with community policies and community work, uh, not everything can be public and you can't talk about all of it. Um, you can just do your best to share what's possible. I think sharing and being transparent is really important. Um, one thing that we do on the AH team is we work on doing, we would really like to be doing them monthly, we really do them quarterly reports uh, where we share what kind, this was inspired by PyCon doing an incident report um, where we share the things that came up. We don't give specifics, we just give general things. We had this many email reports about inappropriate language, we had a report about um, somebody behaving inappropriately at an event, um, and we had uh, an expression about someone um, doing something else that's against the code of conduct. Um, someone brought a dog into a space after people said they were afraid of dogs. That never <laughs> happened, but it's the first thing I could come up with <laughs> on the spot. Um, uh, so, Right, so we try to value uh, people's preferences, uh, and you should too um, when you're doing these sorts of things. Uh, a very famous, uh, well, I don't know if I'd say very famous, but a someone named a package something uh, that other people decided was an inappropriate name um, uh, for a number of reasons. They determined it was an inappropriate name. Uh, they determined that it was not an accident um, uh, that the package had this name. Um, and it was also determined that the package had uh, an inappropriate name, um, very, uh, like, like with great intention, because there were a lot of jokes spawned off of it. The, the project's logo uh, was uh, evocative of its inappropriate name. Um, so Debian said, 
what you can do is you can rename the package or you can remove it. Like those are, those are your options. Like this was the recommendation we made. This is what uh, somebody else followed through uh, on the decision that this was the thing to do is to give them these two options. And they're like, eh. The person who maintained it was like, eh, I don't really want to go through the effort. Um, so it was removed and the internet exploded for a brief period of time. Um, we got a bunch of hate mail, which is something that's always exciting to have happen. Um, of people saying lots of very mean things to us and chiding us for removing the package, um, which, yeah. Um, so ideally what you would do in this situation is you would just ask it to be renamed. You would, you would do what we did. Um, in this particular case, uh, there had also been some inappropriate comments in the code. Um, the language used in that uh, was considered not acceptable for the community. Um, so if that's a thing that happens in general, uh, if there are inappropriate comments, you, you know, you ask people to clean it up. Um, if someone refuses, uh, there are all sorts of things you can do as a community if you really want to keep the work in there. Um, and, uh, and you can always remove it. Um, and you can remove it. And one of the things that's really important to do is when you remove something is to do it under the context of, well, if you make these changes, we can reincorporate it later. Um, related to this, uh, at another point in time, somebody also made another inappropriate, well, somebody named a package something that was reported to us. It may or may not have been inappropriate. It was arguably immature. Um, <laughs> and uh, the FTP masters, the people who decide what actually gets included Within, within the thing that, that we call Debian, um, said, eh, it's not that big a deal. So we were like, OK, well, we'll stay out of this conversation because you determined it's not that big a deal. We had one report, um, but you know, you've already included it. So, uh, this, so I'm using that to, like, to A, give another example of something that happened, but also to illustrate that uh, we make recommendations and not everybody follows them. And uh, not always the recommendations we make are, response, are direct responses. So it's not like somebody reports something to us and then we uh, do what they say. We interpret what, the, what came out. Um, there's also suspending and expelling people. So when something, I mentioned earlier that people communicate inappropriately and you talk with them and you say, hey, can you do a little bit better? Uh, yeah? Sorry, I just have a question. So how do you distinguish between like the public policing and people's First Amendment rights to like free speech or how they express themselves? Like how do you determine what you, I don't have a tech background, I come yeah. from a legal background, so this is just kind of interesting to me. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> I am no one's lawyer because I am not a lawyer. <laughs> or a legal expert, or have any training in the law. <laughs> um, I, I think I read one legal textbook. I've read the Constitution. Um, and I definitely read the Declaration of Independence. Um, so as I understand First Amendment rights, is they specifically refer to the government censoring language. They do not refer to private communities censoring language or determining what is and is not appropriate uh, within that community. Okay. So this is like a private domain? Yeah, and we operate in public, right? Um, so to kind of take a brief tangent and talk a little bit about how the Debian project works, um, uh, it, it's a project. It's a bunch of individuals who have decided to come together um, and participate in what some people describe as one of the great experiments of practical anarchism, um, uh, where they nominate a leader every year. Um, becoming a member of the project, like becoming an official member of the project is actually a drawn out process. Um, I th of the people I know, the shortest time it took someone from application to become a full member to becoming one was three months. Mine was. I wrote about this, I think it was 16 or 18. This is my fault that it took so long, uh, but it definitely did take a long time. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's a 
it's a group of people. It's a project. It's not the government. It's there's no government running it. It's an international space. Um, legal issues in international spaces are very complicated. Uh, so that's how I understand this particular conversation to occur. Um, and we've pretty explicitly um, called out some things that are inappropriate. And so by participating in the community, by agreeing to the social contract, by um, participating in channels where, they, where, we, where someone says, this is the policy for this channel that someone is running, um, and they'll kick you out if you don't follow the policy. Um, there are conversations about it as whenever anything happens, there are conversations you can look in the archives, especially from December uh, and January from the Debian project mailing list, uh, where these discussions occurred, uh, where some discussions around this occurred. Thank you. Um, uh, so that ties well into saying um, when somebody, somebody habitually uh, is inappropriate and doesn't make any effort to change their behavior, you might decide to suspend or expel them. Um, suspending someone is uh, a temporary process. It's when you say, we are asking you to step back for a set period of time, um, after which point, however you're going to work it out. Usually uh, within Debian, when this has happened, to my knowledge, at least in the time that I have been participating, um, it's been uh, after the set amount of time, you can talk to us and ask to be included again. Um, so this actually uh, has happened to my knowledge uh, at least two times that people were suspended. Um, and then they came back uh, and they said, hey, you know, I think what I did, like I, I've looked back on what happened and I don't think I acted in the right way. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, suspension is really reserved for or should be reserved for habitual uh, inappropriate behavior. That's my personal opinion. Um, because we all make mistakes and having a one-off thing is not great. Um, you might expel someone, however, for a really spectacular uh, one-off behavior. Um, uh, historically speaking, there have been several cases where people have been expelled from the Debian project um, in, uh, in response to things that they have done. Um, uh, I won't talk about those right now, but if you'd like to talk about them more at some point, we could do that. Um, yeah, I had another thought that slipped my mind, so it must not have been that important. Um, oh, uh, now I remember. Um, one of the things, uh, especially about suspension and expulsion, um, that you should be asking yourself when you're thinking about uh, enforcing policies is, does it matter to your, like, what are, what are the constraints that matter to your community? Um, so it's, I would net, like, I, Molly DeBlanc, would never make the recommendation to you that you let, uh, like, somebody who's a really, really terrible person, like, somebody who has, like, done, done really heinous things that um, we as a society agree are, in, like, are unacceptable, uh, you shouldn't allow them to participate in your project. It reflects poorly on your project. It creates an unwelcoming space. It creates an unsafe space. Um, you can also ask yourself, like, is it a community value that we want to police people's behavior outside of here? Like, if they're always nice to the people involved, um, do we want to ask them to leave? Yes? Uh, recently, uh, Linus Torvalds released a thing talking about his own toxic behavior. Yeah. Um, have you seen any changes because of that? And how people are looking at their own sort of behaviors? Um, so I was asked that if after Linus Torvalds released his uh, statement about his own inappropriate behavior, other people have uh, considered theirs. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't seen any of that specifically. Um, I can tell you that people use swear words less on the Linux kernel mailing list um, after they instituted a code of, or it, it's not a code of conduct. I forget what they called it, but their, their behavioral policy. Uh, what? Their conduct? Maybe. We used to have the code of conflict, but they recently changed to something updated, though. Yeah, the code of conflict. <laughs> that that banned swearing and. Uh...
the use of swear words dropped uh, <laughs> after it was instituted. So I know that about the Linux kernel community. Um, I have, that was a completely different talk I gave years ago, so I don't know what they're up to now. Um, yeah, but you have to decide for your community what the right thing to do is um, and how you want uh, to be encouraging people to behave inside and outside and what matters to you. Um, uh, so the other thing that we do a lot is nothing. Um, that's one of the most common things we do uh, because in a lot of cases the community manages itself um, and it doesn't need us to intercede in any way. Um, but also like lots of things are pretty minor. Somebody made a one-off thing. It didn't seem like a big deal. Um, it was a simple misunderstanding. Uh, we don't need to make like anybody uncomfortable about it. Um, or, or there's a report and it's actually just nothing. Um, so we don't do things a lot of the time. So being on, a, on an anti-harassment team and enforcing your community guidelines is a lot of hard work. Um, there are huge amounts of hidden labor. Um, so people don't always see what kind of stuff we're doing. Um, since so much of it is happening uh, in closed channels and back channels because we're polite, you know, we, when there have been cases of suspension, what we have tried to do is not list the reasons in public why someone was suspended. We want to give them the option of talking about that because that's their private space and that's their thing to share. Um, so, you know, we, we try to keep things, these kinds of things quiet, uh, not because we're ashamed of them, but because we want to respect the privacy and the autonomy of the individuals involved. Um, this is especially relevant when you're dealing with a report someone has made um, because you don't want to call out somebody who made a report because that makes that suddenly turns making a report into an unsafe practice. Um, so there's a lot of hidden labor. Uh, there's also visible labor. One of the problems with visible labor is when it's visible, it becomes contentious. And that's when you get lots of emails um, and people writing angry things about you on Hacker News and Reddit. Um, I can talk more about this with you privately if you're curious about my exciting examples of cyberbullying, exciting experiences in cyberbullying adventures. Um, but that, that happens. Um, so it's kind of nice when your labor stays invisible. Uh, consensus is hard. We're a small team. Um, so you would think it would be easy for us to all agree, but we don't always. And one of our goals is to agree on what we do uh, because there are so few of us. Um, so we try hard to make that happen. Um, and it's hard. It's not an easy process. Um, but uh, but uh, we do this all, like we follow through on this, because we want Debian to be a welcoming, inclusive place. That's our goal. Our goal is to have it be a community that everyone is proud to participate in, to be a community that people want to participate in, um, and, and to be a space that, like, not only are we comfortable there, but we're proud of it, right? Like, I'm actually really proud that I'm a Debian developer. Um, uh, and I'm proud that my community has decided to recognize me as a member of it. I think that's really amazing. Um, I think the community is really amazing. Um, and I appreciate all of its efforts to, uh, to make itself this place where I feel welcome and included and valued. Um, so that's our goal. So I'd like to thank you. This is, after all those pictures of cats, this is my cat. Aww. My cat's name is Bash. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Um, he's a good kitten. Uh, so that's what I have. Thank you for listening. Um, my name's Molly. This is Linux Fest Northwest 2019. Um, the slides themselves are licensed under a Creative Commons share alike uh, attribution license, um, and they'll be up on my GitLab account soon. So thank you. Do we have time for questions? Uh, yeah, you do. How long? Uh, we're ready to run. <laughs> you can go ahead. Okay, yeah. Uh, yes. So, um, especially in open source where you get people from very diverse backgrounds and people who may never have worked professionally or have worked in various places, how do you find it works best to describe professionalism in a way that gets the idea across to people of all these different backgrounds? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, and that is something I have not approached yet or thought about, which makes it a very good question. 
Um, uh, I, I think w one of the things that you always want to do is you want to provide examples. Um, uh, and it's considered a best practice to provide examples of negative behaviors. Um, and maybe it should also be a best practice to provide examples of positive behaviors as well. Um, uh, so in order to say that, you need to, uh, or in order to convey that, I would come up with some examples that I thought were good uh, and kind of provide it as annotations. Um, that's sort of one of the things Debian has is the community guidelines are kind of like an like annotations or an appendix for the code of conduct. Um, uh, so that also like leads into a really interesting question that's worth talking about, which is how do you decide what's professional um, and what like in, in an international community. Um, because certainly, I default to my, my cultural assumptions, which are about what's professional in the United States, um, especially in like progressive and radical communities. So, yes? Are there places where you can find templates for kind of prefab code of conduct? So say like I'm, I'm looking to monitor our Slack. We have a community yeah. Slack group. And that's not going to be as easy as, say, a mailing list because we'll have multiple channels and different places where things can exist. Mm -hmm. So trying to find a, a template to give me an idea of what not to forget. Yeah. Um, are there templates for codes of conduct? Um, yes. Uh, Geek Feminism has some work that they've done. There's, uh, there are a few different things that are explicitly like, here's a code of conduct or an anti-harassment policy that you can just fill in some specifics to have it geared towards your community uh, or your project. Um, there, you can look at things other people have done and just crib someone else's work. Um, what we did, what 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 we did for Libra Planet uh, at the Free Software Foundation is we took a number of uh, we took several works um, from different individuals and groups. This included, uh, I believe, Ohio Linux Fest work from the Ada Initiative. Um, and some things from geek feminism and combine them into a document that, it's a living document. I mean, so it, it has been updated and it will continue to be updated, uh, I believe anyway. John Sullivan over there might have more to say about that. So you can ask him. Um, uh, the FSF uses the same policy for mailing lists and, uh, well, it's a safe space policy. It's not an anti-harassment or a code of conduct. It's a safe space policy and it applies to uh, all spaces where people within the community are interacting with one another and collaborating. Right. Yes. Um, let's say you have like a disagreement inside uh, the anti-harassment team. I'm just kind of curious on, like, let's say the disagreement is about whether or not a comment is offending. How is that solved inside the team? Uh, is, there, is there like a vote, or is there a hierarchy on who gets to? So what happens when we don't agree on the anti-harassment team? Um, that's a good question, too. Um, I want to say it's a thing that hasn't happened yet, but it is a thing that's happened. Um, and what has occurred is we, we don't have a hierarchy. Oh, we don't have a formal hierarchy. There's an informal hierarchy. The person who's been on the team the longest has a tendency to run the meetings. Um, they're definitely the most vocal member, um, uh, and they're also the person who's the most vocal as an individual about behavior um, within lists and within the community at large. Um, when we've had disagreements, usually what happens is the person who dissents will uh, acquiesce and say, well, I don't really agree, but if you guys feel strongly about it, then you can do that. Um, I don't know what will happen when there's a time when we really strongly disagree with one another. Uh, and maybe that's a thing that I should write down and we should discuss at our next meeting, which is not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. <laughs> yes. One, then two. Please, oh, so it seems to me uh, as companies become more involved you know, in free and open source projects, so this uh, this began to enforce this kind of you know the behavioral rules. I mean, do you agree with me? I mean, the 
Yeah. So, so as, so you, you're right. As companies become more involved, different sorts of rule enforcement has to happen. Um, uh, I don't know about countries outside of the United States for the specific thing I'm going to say. But within the United States, there are laws, uh, there are discrimination laws and there are harassment laws uh, that say things, that describe things that you can't do uh, within work environments. Um, so when somebody violates that, you're dealing with a legal issue. Uh, how it interacts, so like if a company is running a project that is open not a lawyer, not your lawyer, no one's lawyer, no legal training, uh, I would assume that their employees uh, have to interact in certain ways with the community or have to interact in certain, with certain, in certain ways with each other um, because of that. Uh, what I'm really curious about is whether uh, there, will, there will be a time when someone decides that their employer, when someone who is doing work on a free and open source software project uh, for their job, but for a community that's not associated with their employment, when they are harassed, whether that there will ever be a, a legal case around that. That's something I'm really curious about. Um, and I'm interested to see how it plays out should it happen. Sure, quick question. How do you qualify your AH team? How do we qualify our AH team? If you had to start from scratch, how do you say, how do you either vet people? Or... How do we vet people? Um, dark magic? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, uh, so what we've done is we've uh, put out calls um, for people to, so I was, I was courted to join basically. I was asked um, because of uh, work that I'd done uh, in my job because of studies I've done about codes of conduct and their efficacy. Um, uh, so I was asked if I would join. Um, uh, and with Debian, you, my joining was contingent upon me becoming a Debian developer, so that was, that was a requirement. Um, the, we've put out calls for new members um, uh, and we Look at who responds. We